Naturally, with so much material about different kinship systems emerging, particularly in the 18th and 19th centuries, theoreticians began to speculate as to how they could be explained. Basically, there have been over the last 150 years four major schools of interpretation of kinship systems. And it's at these that I would like to look. The first of these is the evolutionary theorists. In the period roughly between 1860 and 1910, partly based on Darwinian biology, partly from geology, anthropological theorizing was dominated by the idea of things moving along an evolutionary path through stages, or using the geological metaphor, like rocks, there being various layers. This set of theories had an immense influence on both anthropology and also sociology and other human disciplines, and it's worth briefly considering its central features. Just to take two of the major theorists, Sir Henry Maine, in his famous book, Ancient Law, in 1861, Maine being a comparative lawyer who was concerned with rights and duties, Henry Maine distinguished between early societies, which were based on status, which was his way of describing kinship-dominated societies, and modern forms of society in which he, for example, lived, which were based on contract, the relationship between individuals within a state. As he put it, the movement of all progressive societies is from societies based on status to those based on contract. And he further elaborated this in suggesting that there had been a series of stages through which all societies would pass, some of them having done so and some would do so in the future. Patrilineal was the starting, then to matrilineal, then to cognatic or modern. Now his distinction between status and contract has been of fundamental importance, but his actual stages were in fact submerged by an even more famous set of stages elaborated by Lewis Henry Morgan in his work on ancient society in 1870. In ancient society, he set forward the view that all societies went through various stages. They started as matrilineal societies, then through patrilineal societies to cognatic or kinless societies. The conjugal family was totally absent, he thought, in the simplest of societies. Nothing whatever was based upon the family in any of its forms, he wrote. A flavor of the kind of evolutionary thinking that he proposed can be seen in the following quotation. It is both a natural and a proper desire to learn how savages advancing by slow, almost imperceptible steps attain the higher condition of the barbarians. How barbarians, by similar progressive advancement, finally attained to civilization, and why other tribes and nations have been left behind in the race of progress. Originally, there was no private property, he argued, no individual marriage. The individual was completely submerged within the matrilineal clan. Gradually, the wider groupings broke down, and the individual was torn himself free and became the modern individual. His influence, or the influence of this part of his work, was extremely important because it was upon this that Marx and Engels based their theories of the family and in their work, or Engels' work, The Origin of the Family, Private Property and the State, this general scheme was adopted. It was only after, Engels argued, after the Middle Ages that the rising bourgeoisie managed to set man free from the domination of kinship. The creation of these free and equal persons was precisely one of the main functions of capitalist production. Allied with this were various theories of primitive promiscuity and marriage capture developed by people like MacLennan. These theories dominated until the end of the 19th century, but they were already beginning to be challenged. There were two major challenges that took place. One of these was known as diffusionism. Evolutionism assumes that there's some inner logic or necessity that you must move through stages, you must move up a ladder. 
that move that things move basically also on a plane from lower to higher. It thus can easily be turned to the uses of political prophecy, as in the case of Marx, who predicted that one will have to move through stages of production and always end up at a certain type of socialist society. Or it could be used in the service of imperialism and colonialism. The backward peoples were at an earlier stage. With our help, they would move from that stage into the next stage and finally catch up and be at our present stage. But Morgan's views upon which this was based were soon bitterly attacked. And just to give you one example of the sort of criticisms, the American anthropologist Robert Lowy, in his book on primitive society in 1929, argued that as far as the matrilineal, patrilineal, cognatic scheme went, every one of the basic points in this line of argumentation may be dismissed as contrary to ethnological evidence. For example, the idea of primitive promiscuity was based on a misunderstanding of simple kinship terms of the kind we mentioned, mistranslation of father and mother. Just because people called a whole lot of people father or mother did not mean that they did not know who their real parents were. Secondly, there was growing evidence that clans and lineages ex uh, of, a, of an extended kinship type were absent in the simplest hunting-gathering societies, that it wasn't a matter of kinship dominating and then slowly becoming less and less dominant, as we've seen. In fact, these large kinship structures only appear with a far richer economic, industrial, ceremonial, and political equipment. Lowy claimed that he had found no mention of clans in accounts of the most primitive hunters, the Bushmen and the Pygmies. Thirdly, there was no necessity for societies to move through a clan stage. I can imagine, he says, the Andaman Islanders, a Siblis, that is, without clans, a Siblis people without any noticeable partiality for either side of the family, their cognatic, rising by successive borrowings to any stage of civilization without necessarily developing into either father Sibs or mother Sibs, i.e. patrilineal or matrilineal. As for the view that primitive societies are democratic and don't have any concepts of private ownership, and that they gradually developed these. They became less democratic, as Morgan had argued. He writes, it may be said categorically that even at his worst, Morgan never perpetrated more palpable nonsense, and that is saying a good deal. In fact, Lowy approvingly quotes the words of the great English legal historian F. W. Maitland, who pointed out that there is no necessity of passing through stages in this way. As Maitland put it, our Anglo-Saxon ancestors did not arrive at the alphabet or at the Nicene Creed by traversing a long series of stages. They leapt to the one and they leapt to the other. Basically, diffusionism is based on this premise that ideas and institutions can spread and when they are adopted by a peoples, you can miss out all sorts of supposed stages. The metaphor really is of a, something uh, a st pebble being dropped in the center of a, a pond and the ripples go outwards and uh, encompass and engulf other societies. Now, that diffusionist, and the word diffusion covers this kind of interpretation, that diffusionist interpretation led to a certain number of rather extreme arguments that everything had started in the Middle East or in a particular society at a specific time and moved outwards and the attempt to try and find cultural traits which had moved from A to B. The more powerful theoretical criticism um, was encompassed in a, an interpretation known as functionalism. This basically dealt with the evolutionist argument by ignoring it. It is the basic structure on which many of these talks have been uh, based. It is evident in the work of people like uh, Haddon, uh, Boaz, Rivers, and others, and later in the work of Malinowski and Radcliffe Brown. These writers rejected this kind of evolutionary history, what, what they sometimes termed conjectural history, or the attempt to place things in stages and in an evolutionary series. They said, it's conjectural, we don't know whether it's right or wrong, and therefore there's no evidence, and therefore there's no point in going on speculating. Let's instead try to see 
what part kinship actually plays in the society, how it functions, what it does for the society. How are things interconnected as they are now, not as they were in the past? For example, what does bride wealth do for a society? What, what is its purpose in the society? How are joking relationships with in-laws to be seen in terms of a contradiction in roles, for example? What do they do? Why do people joke? Not answering why do they joke by saying, well, they've joked for many centuries and in the past, or they got the idea of joking from the Middle East, but because there is tension between in-laws and you resolve this by joking. The two most uh, important theoreticians from this school of functionism were probably Malinowski and Radcliffe Brown. Malinowski's main contribution was not really to the theoretical side of kinship studies so much as in providing or in helping to reinforce the method by which very good and high-class data on kinship and marriage systems was gathered. The famous method of participant observation that is actually going to society, participating and also observing what goes on. He was a superb ethnographer who wrote very detailed accounts of um, Trobriand Island life. His main theoretical contributions were more disputed. One of them was his emphasis on the family as a universal human grouping and the basis from which all of kinship springs. As he put it, I should say that the family is always the domestic institution par excellence. It dominates the early life of the individual. It controls domestic cooperation. It is the stage of earliest parental care and education. And kinship for him was an extension out of that small nuclear family. There have been all sorts of attacks on this extensionist view, as it's called. For example, as we've seen in these talks, the family is not a universal human grouping in that sense. And there are many features of kinship, for example, the kinship terminology, the wider incest taboos, which are not explained by an extension of sentiments from the nuclear family. On the other hand, he did do a great deal of valuable service, for example, in uh, debunking Freud's theories of the Oedipus complex by distinguishing between the social and genetic fatherhood in the Trobriand Islands and in stressing the importance of the principle of legitimacy, of legitimate heirs, that namely in all human societies a father is regarded by law, custom and morals as an indispensable element of the procreative group. More important though in the contribution to theory about kinship and marriage was Radcliffe Brown. He was a student of W.H. Rivers who helped develop the, uh, the conception of the kinship system as composed of both terminology and patterns of social behavior. And to, he was able to see how kinship acts as an integral part of a wider social structure. He looked at the family in terms of formal rights, duties and obligations, rather than as Malinowski had done in terms of sentiment and feeling. His basic unit was not the nuclear family, but dyadic t sets of relationships in which mother and child, father and child, were linked. Among his major contributions and stresses were to show how kinship functions, and this is why it's known as functionalism. As he put it, the general theory that the raison d'etre of an institution or custom is to be found in its social function the theory is therefore that the rules or customs relating to prohibited or preferred marriages have for their social function to preserve, maintain, or continue an existing kinship system as a system of institutionalized ex relations. It's of course, it has a degree of circularity. It functions because it functions. On the other hand, it did provide a legitimate excuse for actually looking at kinship and marriage and not theorizing too much about how it had got there. Also, he showed how marriage was a rearrangement of social structure and not just a private relationship between individuals as it was in the West. He was the one who largely developed the contrast between cognatic and agnatic systems, between lineal and non-unilineal systems, which we now take for granted. He classified father-right patrilineal systems and mother-right cognatic systems and other more exotic systems such as double unilineal and other systems. He showed the 
way in which alternate generations, that is, for example, grandparents and grandchildren, merged and became close together, whereas there was an opposition between parents and children. And he showed the importance of the sibling group, that siblings were very closely united, the unity of the sibling group. A great deal, indeed, of what we learn now is based on his work and the work of his students, because many of the people about whom I've talked uh, and who can be seen on the kinship diagram of kinship theorists like Edmund Leach, Meyer Fortes, and others were influenced by Radcliffe Brown and also by Malinowski. Finally, the, the last interpretation I'll mention is that of structuralism, and this is associated with the name of Claude Levi-Strauss, particularly in his great work, The Elementary Structures of Kinship. Here, some of the major findings were, as we've seen, the distinction between complex and elementary systems of kinship, the stress on marriage and marriage alliances as being alliances between groups rather than the stress on descent and descent groups, which had been inherited from Radcliffe Brown. Behind all his work, though, there laid, lay a completely different idea of what the purpose of anthropology was and a, a different idea of structure. And this is why it's known as structuralism. It's, in fact, de derived from linguistics. And whereas the British regarded social structure as a mechanism of which kinship was a part, rather like a wheel is a part of a car, and you, in order to understand the wheel, you have to understand how it functions in relation to the other parts of the structure. For the French structuralists, like Lévi-Strauss, thinking in linguistic terms, structure lies in the opposition, in the relation of relations, in the opposition between A and B, in the opposition between groups. And the meaning also lies in exchange, how societies exchange women, exchange ideas, and how they circulate these things. So there was a good deal of misunderstanding at first between the two notions of social structure. Edmund Leach, Rodney Needham, and others are the pupils, or at least the, been influenced very strongly by this French form of social, of structuralism. Perhaps I can end this lecture by reminding you that even if it's been difficult to absorb some of these theoretical ideas, you're not in bad company. The best field worker of them all, as we saw Malinowski wrote, I may say that whenever I meet Mrs. Seligman or Dr. Lowy or discuss matters with Radcliffe Brown or Kroeber, names which are now beginning to be familiar, I become at once aware that my partner does not understand anything in the matter, and I end usually with the feeling that this also applies to myself. And although I hope you won't feel that for too long, it is a difficult subject, and there are many technical terms which one has to master. It was during the making of this film in July 1984 that we heard of the death of Dr. Audrey Richards. We would therefore like to dedicate this series to one of the greatest British anthropologists, 